This is The Chris Abraham Show. Hey there, it's Chris Abraham. This is the Chris Abraham Show, season five, episode uh, eight, maybe. No, that was it's, uh, season five, episode nine. Welcome to Chris, the Chris Abraham Show, season five, episode nine. This is about the Ukraine war. And it's very hard to tell what's going on at all so I don't know it's uh, a little bit in the world of chaos like is this something is this uh, how serious is this right like I read something that Greg Greenwald uh, Greg Greg Greenwald uh, said on Twitter today which is to say that people the Department of Justice is going after black activists who are posting memes that are considered pro-Russian, which is to say anti-Ukraine in terms of this fight between Ukraine and Russia. And um, that's a very vulnerable spot because I believe that the entire Ukraine war was uh, was fomented by Western interests uh, in uh, in further Eastern hegemonic, uh, I don't know, imperialism. I believe that there is enough, there is enough hostility between NATO and BRICS, B-R-I-C-S, which is a... uh, a NATO-like trade organization that's actually a security organization that used to be just Brazil, uh, Russia, India, and China, but now is Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa that is starting to develop a strong cohesion. A cohesion that is never mentioned in mainstream media is downplayed as being merely a drinking club in the same way that NATO is downplayed as merely a defensive organization. So, I am slightly, uh, feeling slightly under the potential jackboot of Western imperialism in my own country, right? Is it... Is it legal for me to speak out against uh, what I consider to be an unjust war, a war that um, was picked and wasn't uh, and has been going on at one level or another since well before 2014? In fact, a war that has been in the making and in the preventing since uh, since you know 1989, 1990. The only common thread that has been going on in uh, a collapsed Russia, a former Soviet Union, is uh, we need a buffer state, and that buffer state is Ukraine, for several reasons, for, of of course, security reasons, but also because... um, Because Ukraine is the bread basket of the region, is resource intense, and is the birthplace of, um, of the Russian people. So, you know, in uh, very early times, uh, Greeks and Nordics and Vikings and all these other peoples came together in Ukraine and uh, 
you know, the Greeks gave the Cyrillic alphabet and the Vikings gave the the obsession with Vikings, first of all. And the uh, Kiev was actually the birthplace of of the Russian ethnicity, of the Russian uh, nationality, of the Russian uh, perceived bloodlines, right? The the Slavicness, the Russianness, the culture, all born. Uh, so in many ways, uh, Ukraine is the is the Jerusalem of uh, or Mecca. Ukraine is the Mecca. Um, of uh, of Russia, so in many ways, it's a security buffer. It's a nuclear buffer. It is a um, it's a general. You know, you're sovereign, but you're not. A sphere of influence that Russia finds um, existentially threatening, and so when. Ukraine decided that it was going to be on the steady march east. The steady march, you know, that went through, um, of course, you know, went through my people, right? Went through uh, Czech uh, Czech Republic, Slovakia, you know, a march east that adopted uh, the euro, the euro, and adopted uh, NATO, and adopted uh, new constitutions. The next, uh, the next domino in the um, the falling dominoes of Western imperialism was, of course, going to be Ukraine, and so Russia made v- very clear with uh, Bush the. Uh, Elder and Bush the Jr. and in every administration since uh, Bush the Elder that this was a red line. It was a red line in the sand. It was a line in the sand and that uh, there was no way that Ukraine could either uh, become part of the EU or become part of NATO. That this needed to remain uh, sovereign, independent, and so forth, but it also needed to remain under, uh, in the shadow of, of the Russian uh, Federation. So, one can say that you can't blame the victim, but I've never perceived, nobody's ever perceived Ukraine as a victim. Ukraine is historically, I mean, maybe Moldova is more corrupt than Ukraine, but Ukraine is is historically incredibly corrupt, incredibly dodgy, um, incredibly opportunist, um, and, uh, you know, I believe that uh, Volodymyr Zelensky is a complete American puppet, puppet, not even a European puppet or not even a British puppet, but an American actor, I mean, uh, a Ukrainian actor, who was um, given the job of playing the part of the prime minister or president or whatever of Ukraine. So um, I saw this coming all the way back when John McCain, John McCain, right? McCain, not McLean. (laughs) Uh, John McCain, uh, the neoconservative head, maestro who you know died of cancer and um donald trump said uh i like my veterans uh, not being taken prisoner that one john mccain and his neoconservative neoliberal posse have been um spending time in ukraine you know, back before 2014, before the revolutions, before um, former Russian uh, aligned interests uh, were, uh, were, you know, driven out of uh, Ukraine and before, even before Russia 
um, went ahead and, and invaded and annexed Crimea. So, or Crimea, Crimea. So this has been something that has been a slow burn uh, for 14 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 22, 23, for 10 years, right? Um, almost 10 years. 2014 is uh, nine years ago. So it obviously has been happening for over a decade. I mean, we look at it um, over the last, you know, over a year. But these are things that we could have obviously, if we were interested in peace and not interested in goading, um, you know, maybe it's taken 10 years for the op to really gain the kind of steam and to line everything up in the correct way. I mean, I hate to say it, but looking at how uh, Vladimir Putin has behaved uh, since he ascended into power... Uh, he's been amazingly restrained, right? Like, considering that this has been happening underneath his watch for um, just under a decade, if not longer, and we can definitely say that this has been happening even longer than that, uh, I would say that there's been an extreme amount of restraint and that instead of going ahead and picking a fight until recently with the entire West... Putin decided that he needed to go ahead and um, start his own drinking club, right? And the drinking club, which has been, was it 2003, 2013? I don't know. There just seems to be a lot of synchronicity between uh, when the front door of Eastern Europe have started to become shadowed by the West and when Russia turned towards uh, the Middle East, towards Africa, towards China, towards Brazil, towards India as a way of trying to find a countermeasure against Western hegemony, uh, dollar supremacy, U.S. dollar supremacy, uh, U.S. finance and banking supremacy, and so forth, and find a series of allies, um, and then to, you know, um, walk softly and carry a big stick. And as we see from the result of these altercations, the West isn't comfortable. The West is holding the reins as well. We've, we Americans and the West in general have been extremely restrained, right? If you look into the documents that were recently revealed um, by that poor little um, airman first class or seaman first class or whatever he was, that little 14-year-old boy who just happens to be 21 and on a Discord server, all those docs, which I think were placed anyway, suggest, if there's any suggestion there, uh, that um, Voldemort, no, Vl Vladimir... Zelensky really wants uh, long-range missiles to be able to hit deep into Russian territory and wants F-16s, F-18s, uh, F-15s to take the fight into Russia. And um, uh, America and the EU and NATO and Great Britain, which plays a very big part of this, don't allow... Um, don't allow the UK to play all coy. Do not allow them to um, try to suggest that they're anything less than, you know, they're, they're essentially as powerful as the Dutch are. Like the Dutch and the Brits have extreme amounts of business and, and, and governmental leverage all around the world. Like the Dutch, they play like little truth-telling little... Uh, quirky, funny people with silly American accents who know all the languages. But uh, if you go anywhere in the world, especially in a petro state or a place that's um, that's receiving uh, gas channels, uh, you'll see you know Texans, Dutch people, and you'll see uh, you'll see um, um, uh, 
you'll see bankers from the city of London, right? You'll see uh, people who are uh, from former, former colonial nations, but they took a hint from America where you just pretend like you're not a colonizer, but you, you know, you have all the control. You um, are a invisible partner. You're a silent partner. You're a quiet partner. You are driving from the back seat, and that's what a lot of that influence comes from. So, as a result, you know, you there is a an in, intentionality to convert the borscht, uh, not borscht, but the boars, uh, the, the, the oil market, the oil brokering world from a hundred percent borscht, is it borscht, from a hundred percent dollar base uh, trading system to possibly a, um, a Chinese or I don't know a, a different a different currency uh, that can um, that can get around all of these you know restrictions and limits and um, all of these uh, financial handcuffs that the United States has put on Russia uh, over the last fifteen years. I know for a fact that when I worked in the cryptocurrency world. <laughs> And I was doing hearts and minds work for a cryptocurrency company. I know that it was an open secret that China and Russia were trading um, in the black market space. Uh, they were just two giant whales that even though they weren't allowed to trade with, the other, with each other because of sanctions on Russia, they were making huge, huge, huge trades using uh, Ethereum and Bitcoin. And uh, you could watch the, um, you could watch uh, the blockchain. You could see the trades that were happening in huge multi-billion and multi-million dollar trades. And those were happening between uh, sovereign, um, sovereign nations. And they were happening uh, above and below the sanction space. And they were happening happening around uh, traditional SWIFT banking, and they happen every day. I mean, when I traveled around the world, I got to spend a little bit of time in uh, Bangkok, and my friend Anne had a cousin or an uncle, cousin, I think, who was an oil broker, and he brokered oil as an American citizen. He brokered oil and to Cuba, to Iran, you know, it didn't matter. Um, oil trades, that kind of thing transcends, right? Like it was routine information back in 1996 that uh, once you get oil into a tanker, those tankers can be hot swapped. Uh, their numbers can be changed. They can uh, duplicate each other. They can uh, transfer oil from one tanker to another. There's all kinds of subterfuge that can happen to make sure that that oil is laundered so that it can go from, uh, from Iran or from Russia and go to some place that has sanctions on uh, Russia and Iran. It's a force of nature. Uh, these are resources, and the world doesn't care about uh, saber rattling or um, or uh, virtue signaling. Business needs to get done, and if you need to go a little bit of gray hat or black hat, you need to go a little bit of gray market or black market. It's going to happen. Uh, what is it called? No cop, no crime. Uh, in, in a world where. It's entirely difficult to enforce international law sanctions when you do not have international police. There are no Martians or there are no Star Trek Federation or there are no uh, Star Wars rebels or whatever. There are no superior races that can come down and enforce um, 
you know, enforce a law if it is at the um, nuclear, uh, at the level where, you know, it's, there's sovereign countries and they have nuclear weapons and they have their own uh, sovereignty and they have their own armies and they're not going to put up with something like some, you know, like a, a little pissant country like, you know, Iraq or Kuwait or a little pissant country like even Afghanistan or or uh, even Pakistan is a pissant enough country that they can be n- manipulated. But countries like Russia and India and even, I guess, South Africa and Brazil and Argentina, um, these are countries that are becoming harder and harder to control. Back in the 80s, 90s, and 2000s, the IMF and the World Bank had pretty good carte blanche and control uh, over them because there was a lot of um, money that was lent and there was a lot of leverage and nobody's willing to default. But as the world becomes more chaotic, the countries uh, can look at the World Bank and the IMF and and say, listen, we will default. And so we're going to turn everything around on you and we're going to have the leverage because can you imagine the cataclysm now that we're not afraid of you anymore? And of course, with crypto and everything else, with the dark web, with, 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 with communication channels that transcend the normal SWIFT networks and the normal trades and normal accountability and normal audits, it's really hard to follow those things. So is this uh, podcast going to be banned? Am I going to get a phone call from the Department of Justice? Am I betraying the United States by saying that... Um, that Ukraine is not uh, is not on the right side of history with regards to this. I mean, I don't blame Ukraine. Ukraine is just doing Ukraine. Ukraine doesn't want to be anybody's bitch. And Ukraine, because it's so corrupt, is kind of used to going ahead and getting away with stuff. It's a beautiful upstart. Um, that said, um, the truth is, is that I'm sure Russia isn't isn't 150 or 200,000 uh, soldiers in the hole. And I guarantee you that Ukraine is burning through people in, a, in an irreplaceable way as well. And I, I dare say that maybe at some point Ukraine is going to give up all of its people and we're going to find out that there are more Ukrainians living uh, in America, you know, that have come here uh, with families or married here or emigrated here or immigrated here or uh, because of freedom of movement uh, are in, you know, Germany and in uh, France and in and, and England and the UK and all over Europe. Uh, they have beautiful people. They have talented people. They have extremely well-educated people. Uh, they have beautiful women. Uh, and there's a lot of ill-gotten gains that are spendy, spendy, that um, there's a lot of uh, soft influence around the world from expat Ukrainians. And I'll tell you a lot of like a lot of the um, the feelings of, of the aggressive political decisions that are being made against people like Cubans, like Cuba, are being done by soft power of Cuban Americans in Florida. A lot of the hostility and aggression towards uh, Persia and Iran is done out of the soft power from uh, wealthy um, expats who left um, Iran in the 60s and 70s when they lost, uh, when, you know, in the same way with uh, Cuba, when it went from being a westernized power to being more of a uh, observant um, theocracy and Muslim country. Um, And I believe a lot of the conspiracy behind using Ukraine as a... I don't even know. Like, they're kind of being thrown to the lions. They're being completely used. Like, basically, Ukraine is being completely used. And they're going to suffer for it. They're going to... Uh, they're being thrown like, like, like fodder into the, into the fire. And 
Nobody's going to be held accountable for that. Everything they do is noble and patriotic and for freedom and for democracy. Even, nobody ever speaks about the corruption and the, um, the autocracy. And, the, uh, and even right now, because it's, they're in war, uh, Zelensky gets to be a bit of a, of a, of a, um, of a despot because it's a time of war. And during a time of war... Uh, the rules are thrown away and you have to uh, f pursue a certain level of martial law in order to keep uh, the, uh, very literally, uh, the leopard tanks um, on time, right? So anyway, we'll see what happens. I'm surprised that America's attention hasn't gotten distracted away from uh, Ukraine. I believe that Ukraine, I think that Europe is incredibly hungry for the breadbasket known as Ukraine. I think that they just really want Ukraine as part of the um, agricultural uh, assets that, that, that NATO and Western Europe has. I believe that this has zero to do with Ukraine, with the Ukrainian people, with uh, Vladimir Voldemir, Voldemort, Zelensky, or any of those other people. Um, possibly, this might have to do with uh, regime change in Russia, but I dare say that, like I said, um, uh, Voldemort, Vladimir Putin, is extremely professional, extremely restrained, and everybody around him is much more of an extremist. So this comes down to the devil we know versus the devil we don't. So I don't know. Will uh, regime change in Russia result in, in something worse or better? Like, in order for this to actually make sense, uh, Vladimir Putin needs to be toppled by the actual will of its people and not by some sort of hearts and mind false flag political campaign where people are temporarily fooled or a rigorous 20% of activists, elitists, you know, the same kind of people who dominated Kabul, uh, harvested all their um, generals, daughters, women and girls, and then, you know, said, okay, it's fine to go ahead and bomb and rocket and, um, and drone uh, rural women and children, right? Screw those people. Screw those, uh, uh, those weddings and screw those funerals. Let's just drone them. So I believe that we're not nearly as uh, careful with life or caring about life as we like to say. And that's what that brutality makes us incredibly effective when it comes to um, making the sausage. And for a fact, we don't want to ever see where the sausage is made. So we'll see. Will Ukraine last another year? Will Vladimir Putin fall? Will the current government fall? And will it become, will Russia become a true democracy? Which, you know, it's not. So many people are so stupid. Like, the Russian Federation is not the CCCP, right? And America is not um, what it seems either. There are tons of people that I know in Moscow who live Western lives with, um, you know, with, with summer homes and cars and university and chess matches and picnics and discotheque and going out to dine. Like, this is not a world where uh, there is no middle class. Anyway, I dropped my phone. I hope it's not broken. Um, we'll see. Will I be thrown into the, uh, into jail for recording this? I'll talk to you soon, and I really enjoyed chatting with you. Talk to you later. Bye-bye.
Thank you for listening to The Chris Abraham Show. Make sure you subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Until next time. Thank you.